Once I was blind, but now I can see the light of the world is Jesus. Let's stand tonight and take your chorus book. Take your chorus book, turn to uh, chorus number 105. Nothing is impossible. We'll stand and we'll sing through this twice. Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Nothing is impossible when you're trusting in His Word. Hearken to the voice of God to thee. Is there anything too hard for me? Then put your trust in God alone and rest upon his word for nothing oh everything yes everything is possible with god again nothing is impossible when you put your trust in god nothing when you're trusting in his word hearken to the voice of God to thee is there anything too hard for me then put your trust in God alone and rest upon his word for everything oh everything yes everything it's possible with God. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for that truth that we just sang about, that nothing is impossible, that uh, you know the beginning from the end. You are eternal. Uh, you are the creator of all that is. And so, Father, we come to you as our creator asking that you would be with us tonight, that you would strengthen and encourage each person that's here be with pastor as he teaches the lesson tonight and speak through him with power and authority and understanding that we might take these truths and have a closer walk with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated and take your hymn book. Take your hymn book and turn to number 208. Hymn number 208, Grace Greater Than All Our Sin. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount of poured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. pardon and cleanse within grace grace God's grace grace that is greater than all our sin sin and despair like the sea waves cold Threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold. Point to the refuge, the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God's grace. pardon and cleanse within grace grace God's grace grace that is great 
the page 209, 209, Sunshine in the Soul. <laughs> there is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in and the earthly sky. For Jesus is the light. Oh, there, sunshine, blessed sunshine, where the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Verse 4. There is gladness in my soul today, and hope and praise and love for blessings which she gives me now, for joy is laid up above. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, where the peaceful happy moments roll when Jesus shows his smiling face there is sunshine in my soul all right good singing pastor amen I hope there's sunshine in your soul tonight and uh, glad you made it to the service. Good to see each one of you. And our, cl our crowd is getting thinner. Uh, you want to hear that when you go to the doctor, but not at church, right? Brother Gene's rubbing his belly. And uh, I know we've had some snowbirds travel back north. It's getting closer to the warmer months. And uh, we're going to miss them. And if you're a snowbird and you're with us right now, we'll miss you when you leave. Um, but we also love this time of year for so many reasons. Keep our snowbirds in prayer, if you would, as they travel back north. A uh, couple of announcements this week. Praise God, we had great services Sunday, and um, uh, it, was a, it was a blessing. Uh, sunrise service, uh, we put out not enough chairs, once again, and uh, the last, year, last year we put out, I think, 75 chairs is what I rented, or 50, and I had 100 folks last year, and this year for sunrise we had 125 show up. Amen. I think I had 85 chairs. So next year, I'm going to encourage folks to bring your own chair, and we'll, we'll handle it that way, something that's comfortable, and you can haul in and haul out, and, uh, but it was a good service, uh, wonderful weather. It felt air-conditioned out there, didn't it? And uh, there was a chill in the breeze, and uh, so we had had a number of folks that was their first time. They don't go here. They showed up. I didn't even recognize them. They rolled in, and uh, we got to greet some folks. We had some first-time visitors for Sunday morning service little over 140 or around there for the morning service. Here's what's interesting. If everyone from Sunrise had stuck around for the morning service, we would not have had room for everybody. Yeah. And so we had about a 30% attrition rate after the Sunrise service and still had 140 in the a.m. 
And um, it was a blessing. A uh, number of folks stuck around. We had the kids with the uh, egg hunt and uh, had some ministry opportunities. So thank you for inviting folks. And Sunday, I'm going to say it again, uh, that is the mark of a healthy church. And I love it. So keep up the good work. Be not weary in well-doing. Um, also, this week was, uh, was good for me. Uh, this past week, we I finished up, we were working on a Bible study, mentoring. I've been doing a mentoring Bible study uh, with some men, some young men that I had selected, and we finished it up this week, and so we're planning to start into another 12-week Bible study, discipleship, and I'd like to have more of those groups going. If that's something that you'd be willing to do, lead a discipleship group, or you say, Pastor, I've never led one before, could I tag along and see what it looks like? I'd be happy to have you tag along, and uh, we get more of those started. Individual discipleship is where I think many times soul-winning churches drop the ball, and folks get saved or they come in, and we just expect sometimes people to know what they're supposed to do by, by you know, just by osmosis. Well, it doesn't work that way. Um, we're supposed to train up leaders and help folks along, and that's what Paul told Timothy. He said, the things that thou hast received of me among faithful men, commit to others and uh, train them so they can, they can be able to do likewise. And I feel, you say, Pastor, why are you telling us we're Wednesday night crowd? Well, because you're most likely the people who would make good disciplers. Uh, you're here on Wednesday night because you're here on purpose. Amen? Did you guys get here on purpose? Okay, nobody by here by accident. I didn't think so. Uh, so pray about, uh, pray about being willing to lead a discipleship group, and um, if you'd be willing to do that or you're not sure what that means, uh, get with me. It would be wonderful. It'd be a gift, and I think God doesn't just want us to just share the gospel and let it fall. That's the starting point. Uh, making disciples is really what we're called to do, disciples of Jesus Christ. So uh, be in prayer about that. Um, also this weekend, uh, men's prayer breakfast and ladies' Bible study, and the sign-up sheet's back there for men's prayer breakfast. I think we have 18 signed up so far, so that's going to be a good group, and we'll have a ladies' Bible study at 9.30, right, Miss Jennifer? And then uh, door-to-door soul winning at 10, and so pray for good weather. Um, it's interesting, there's a man I met in the gym today, well, I've met him some time ago, and I've been talking to him. And uh, he, he, he found out I was a pastor. I, I'm sure I told him. And I said, I live in your neighborhood. My church is in your neighborhood. And he says, why didn't you invite me to your church? And I said, well, I think I did. He goes, no, I would have come. So I invited him to my church. Well, we're going to knock on his door this Saturday because he's in the area right here in our neighborhood. And there's a, so be in prayer for those efforts and the different things uh, that go on. I want to read to you one or two um, prayer letters. Also, this week our financial statements are out, and this is the financial statement for the month of March. If you're a member here at Independent, you're welcome to pick one of those up back at the information desk. And I don't have a, I don't have a label for the information desk, but we're, we're going to get one and stick it on there. That way when you'll know what it's called, the information desk back in the corner. Um, I have a, a prayer letter here from the Jacksons. Braxton Jackson and his family to India, and uh, they are our missionaries. We've supported them now for a while, and uh, we got in. We got a, kind of an issue. I didn't have prayer letters from him for a while, and I reached out to him, and he said, "I got your email mixed up. Here they are." So we're getting them now. He says, "After a time of recharging in Thailand, we made it back safely home. Thank you to everyone who prayed for our return. I'm back in language school." And I praise the Lord for good progress. I've become more conversational and have gained confidence in my ability to share the gospel in Hindi. Please pray for me as I'm going out regularly to try and communicate the gospel with as many as I can. I'm nervous, but trusting the Holy Spirit to open hearts and give me supernatural utterance. God can do that. I'm also happy to share that Liz has started her formal language study. Taking care of two toddlers and keeping house is already a full-time job, so it's been difficult to schedule time for her to go to school. However, we were able to find a Hindi tutor who can come teach Liz at home. This has been a huge blessing. Liz is having fun, and I'm enjoying, I enjoy having someone with whom I can study. It's hard to believe the end of our first term is less than four months away. Please pray that our remaining time will be productive. God willing, this will be the last time we have to leave the country so soon. 
We plan to travel quite a bit during our time back in the States this summer. I'm, now wor- I'm working now to book meetings to raise ministry support for our second term. Please pray for India. In the northeastern state of Manipur, there have been civil unrest for quite some time now. Just last week, there was another incident. Hundreds of protesters attempted to storm a police station. They were fired upon by local police. Two, dozen were, two, two were killed and dozens more were injured. This stems from an ethnic conflict that's been ongoing for a year now. The unrich, unrest has even reached Delhi, where protests have taken place at the capital. I don't know all of the history or reasons behind the issues in Manipur, but I know the answer is Christ. Whether it's in India or the good old USA, everywhere you go, there are political problems, racial problems, ideological problems, etc. As believers, we know that all these problems are heart problems, and Jesus is the only answer. May we pray for our political leaders to come to know Christ as Savior. Thank you for your faithfulness. We're praying for you all. Joy in Christ, Braxton Jackson. Then I wanted to bring you up to date as well. I had somebody ask me about our missionary, Joel Desir, because you're aware that the situation in Haiti is so dangerous right now. And he says, during the last month, I've, it's really been sad to see what's going on in Haiti, where the gangs, the gangs control 80% of the population. They kill and uh, victimize and even kill police. They have burned down many of the police stations at Port-au-Prince, They broke into two prisons where they allowed 5,000 prisoners to escape. Some of them are very dangerous. Most of the churches have closed down. Many of my church members are scared and have left town because it's no longer safe. The prime minister flew out of Haiti three weeks ago and was not allowed to return because the gangs did not want him to. He even resigned because he was scared. The gang's plan is to take over the White House and have their own president. Please pray for Haiti. It is in a dire state of emergency right now. Even with all those things happening, we keep preaching the gospel and doing soul winning. For the last two months, we've seen 80 people saved. 18 were baptized. Raudi, one of my college students, shared a salvation story with me. He met a man, a young man named Kesnel, who had been a member of a non-denominational church for many years. He asked Kesnel if he would go to heaven when he died, to which he replied, he hoped he would. If he worked hard enough, he would get to heaven. Raudi opened his Bible and shared the gospel with him. Finally, Kesnel got saved. When Raudi shared some Bible verses about being baptized, Kesnel said he wanted to be baptized and took the required class but failed the test. Raudi said the Bible did not require any new believers to take an exam before being baptized in water. After Rudy showed him more Bible verses concerning baptism, Kesnel asked to be baptized. The next Sunday, he came and worshiped with us. Please pray for him as he continues to serve in the Lascohobas Church. Because of the danger and the instability, my wife and girls will stay in the United States while I travel back and forth to make sure that everything is under control. My national pastor who graduated from our Bible Institute, will take over the ministry when I'm out of the country. Please pray for peace to be restored in Haiti. And so uh, Joel Desir, is, he's stationed here in the United States right now. He's able to fly into an area that's a little safer than the main airport um, and able to keep the ministry going. So pray for him. Very difficult, dangerous situation there in Haiti at this time. All right, let's continue singing. Take your hymnal out once more if you would. In your hymn book, 397, 397, little as much when God is in it. We'll sing the first and the last verses only, verse 1 and 4. In the hall. Field now ripened, there's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth and fame. There's a crown. 
and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Verse 4, when the conflict here is ended and a race on earth is done, he will say to all the faithful, welcome home, my child, well done. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. All right. It's all yours. Amen. And um, pray for Miss Beth. She told me she's not feeling well this evening. She'll be with us next week. So keep her in prayer if you would. Um, we have our prayer requests at this time. I have a couple of prayer requests I wanted to mention to you. And uh, just to emphasize, I spoke with Miss Mary Copeland today. Buck and Mary Copeland come to our church usually on Sunday evenings. And um, it's a little less crowded for them. Miss Mary, uh, she uses a cane, and she's vision impaired. She had neck surgery about six weeks ago, and um, they had to uh, alleviate some areas in her where her spine was getting pinched. And uh, she was here Sunday morning, first service that she's been back at since the surgery. And pray for her. Pray for Mary Copeland. Also pray for Carol Hughes. Carol Hughes. Uh, she had back surgery and made it through. Uh, she went through rehabilitation. Now she's at home. They're coming in and helping her, but she's still got some real limitations, and so she would appreciate your prayers. Um, I took some, some of our freezer meals over to her Monday, and uh, she was happy about that. Got to pray with her, talk to her, and so pray for Carol Hughes as she recovers. Also pray for John McCluskey. He fell, what's it been, about a week ago now, a little over a week? Okay. And uh, he actually fractured a uh, vertebra in his back, and he's having some balance issues where his balance, he'll just lose his balance. Otherwise, seems to be healthy, but just out of the blue, loses his balance. And so he needs your prayers, if you would pray for him. Is there anything else to add, Miss Linda? Is that about it? Okay. You're welcome. Yeah, pray for, pray for John. Um, also pray for Richie Urbanowski, still recovering from his accident and broken hip, um, trying to get around. Continue to pray for Miss uh, Betty Lou, Betty Lou Carpenter. Uh, just a lot of trials in her life right now. She's struggling with, struggling with discouragement, some health problems. She's had a knee replacement and uh, just a lot of things dealing with. It seems like when it rains, it pours, right? And so pray for Miss Betty Lou. Pray for a friend of mine. His name is Neil. And um, he's been out to the property here several times, but never church. So he'll come out and visit me. But I haven't got him to come to church yet. And uh, we were talking about the Lord today. And um, he was just expressing how that there's a lot of discouraging things going on right now. And he's praying for God to give him peace. I think Neil's a believer, uh, but I'm not sure. So pray for my friend Neil. And then pray for, uh, I, I met a woman Monday, her name is Sherry, and uh, her husband um, has a neurological issue, Sherry Statler, she's uh, in the area, met her at the YMCA and she asked for prayer for her husband who's got a neurological problem, Sherry's a believer, don't know what church she goes to, and, uh, but just pray for Sherry's husband, a neurological issue. Any other issues or problems, updates or praises, we'll allow those. Miss D, we'll get you the microphone over there. And when you get the microphone, just be sure to hold it up to your mouth so we can hear you. Melinda went to uh, the therapist to, that's going to help her with her prosthetic. And the prosthetic, they gave her a, a temporary one till they make her special one does not fit so there'll be a bit of a delay but she needs prayers to help that go 
Let's move. Okay. Go ahead, Brother Wayne. Um, I think it was last week I requested prayer for a friend of mine, Keith Scheffler. Yes. They had a liver re uh, transplant. Well, he's in the, got an update yesterday that he's still in the hospital. He is, the, today is his 45th day in the hospital, and uh, he's still having some issues. And so just continue to pray for him. I had written down that he needed a liver transplant, so I got that wrong. Yeah, he, had he had one, recovering from one. I just want to say that we have to remember to all, always thank the Lord for answered prayers that we did not ask for because <laughs> Monday something happened and as it was happening, it, it was a three-hour process that I was on hold and everyone that I talked to that day was a Christian because hmm. I, I started talking to them and they... They all were, but as I was doing what I was doing, it was something with my insurance, but I, I was like, thank you, God, because it was an answer to a prayer that I didn't even know that I was supposed to have asked him, right. and I just think that we should always remember to do that. Yeah, amen, amen. God looks out for us. Miss Susie, oh, go ahead, Tommy. Yeah, uh, Pastor was a, was a fellow or the missionary that was that was held for ransom in Haiti. Is is that who that letter was from? Yes, that was Joel. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. I just, that was we him. just need to pray for Haiti. That's Port-au-Prince, Haiti. That's just demolishing it, and, and it's just not even safe to be on the streets. And he's the kind of guy that'll stay there till they kill him. Right. You know? Yeah. You're right. We need to pray for Haiti and pray for Brother Joel. Yes. Uh, Dave, right over here in the middle, Miss Susie Perry. Thank you, sir. Yes, we'd like for you to pray for our daughter, Christina Morgenstern. She's having a lump removed from her breast tomorrow. So she's a little nervous. She's got some bad results from two or three other tests, so she's just a little nervous about everything. Absolutely. Go ahead, Simone. You're good. Um, I had been praying because I can't get out to do uh, visitation and things like that. So I've been praying about the Lord using me in some way. And it wasn't a week, two weeks later that I met my neighbor. And she was brought up, you know, as a Christian but she isn't going any place and not studying. And so I've been trying to be a mentor to her, and I'm asking the Lord to use me. And then I had somebody else that stays at the, the mobile home next to me, and um, she's been brought up a Christian, and she's not, you know, in... Uh, in the um, studying anymore or anything. And so, and then there was a third one, and I just can't, oh, I know, I met a lady out in the parking lot at um, Winn-Dixie. She's probably in her 30s, and she's out of church. And I, after we talked for a half an hour at 10 o'clock at night, <laughs> we, um, I gave her my phone number, she gave me hers, and so I want to be a, I'm praying the Lord will use me there. And you know what? Now, like I've said before, God answers prayers. Um, it's just amazing what he's doing. And um, I'm praying that I'm up to the task. Amen. So, that, and I'm going in for eye surgery the 23rd. Um, cataracts. And then two weeks later, I hope they're going to do the other one. Okay. 
Let's continue to pray for Jeannie Berger. She had a doctor's appointment Monday, hasn't been feeling well. Her health is what I would call frail, and she's, you know, she needs your prayers. Uh, she hasn't been feeling well. I didn't get a chance to check with them today. It was on my list, and my list got away from me. So pray for them. They follow our services faithfully, sweet people. They've been connected with the church here for many years, and um, Bob requested prayer for her on Sunday. We just need to keep her in prayer. Yes, John, over here, uh, Dave. Uh, we have a, I have a praise for my, uh, my wife. You know, we've been dealing with some things for a few months. We're still waiting on the actual biopsy. Yeah, there's been some issues with that, but she did have to take a, some type of a genetic blood test that was specifically uh, to test for cancer. And we got a call yesterday, and they said that came back extremely low risk. Okay. So Amen. praise God for that. But we, you know, we still got to get the biopsy, but we're trusting God that he's going to take care of it. Amen. Good news. Good news. Scott? Two things. First of all, I'm appreciative to the doctors out there. The stuff they got to go through, like dealing with my dad, has got to be a chore. But luckily, they're hopefully getting him on track to where he can get his mind leveled out. And it's either they're going to have to do something with him or do something with me. So hopefully, it'll work out with him. Second of all, I was watching the news today, and the abortion issue apparently is going to be on the ballot for the election this year. Please get out and vote. Yeah. It's the only way we're going to get that taken care of. We got to we got to fight against the devil on that. So, please get out and vote. Yeah, amen. Amen. Miss Donna, over here. I'm so thankful for Brother Spangler. Thank you, sir. He gets his miles in on in, in the service. I would like to ask prayer for Dave. Tangway. He is a man that lives in the park where my daughter works. He was in a serious car wreck recently, and he has a broken back, a broken sternum, several other broken bones, and they thought at first his neck was broken, but they're not sure about that now. But, but uh, he has a long recovery ahead of him. He, it, just thank God he's still alive, but the, prayer needs, the family needs prayer. Dave Tangway. Tangway. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think that's it. Appreciate your requests and uh, keep up sharing those with each other. And um, let's continue to share when God answers these. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer if you'd bow with me. Lord, I come before you tonight, and I thank you for listening to us. I thank you for the command to pray. Um, I just was reading through where you told your disciples how to pray in the book of Luke. And you've told us to worship you in prayer, to ask for what we need in prayer, to ask for forgiveness. Dear Lord, I, I do ask for some things. Uh, dear Lord, there are some uh, connected with our ministry church members and those who attend who are not well tonight. They'd like to be here with us and cannot because of physical problems. Lord, please bring healing. Dear Lord, there are some here tonight who are struggling with emotional and relationship issues. I pray, God, that you would bring healing there as well. Lord, I pray that you'd be with these that were mentioned who are struggling in pain or in recovery. This Keith uh, Shetler and uh, Christina. Dear Lord, I pray that you would just be with them. Be with Christina, dear Lord. Still her heart. Guide the doctors. Uh, protect her from, from ad, uh, anxiety. Give her confidence. I pray, dear Lord, that you'd be with um, the different ones that were uh, just talking about desire to witness more. Ms. Simone and, and others, dear Lord. I thank you for answering prayers. As Cindy said, that we don't even remember to ask, and yet 
I believe the Holy Spirit intercedes on behalf of us according to your will. Thank you so much for that. Lord, I do pray that you would um, just be with uh, Scott and his family as he cares for his father. Um, I pray, God, that you'd be with the Tangway family, a serious car accident that he suffered. Uh, Lift them up, draw them to yourself. Use this as a tool to reach that family, Lord. I pray, God, that you would be with um, Sherry and her husband, be with Neil. Dear Lord, I pray that you would uh, be with our country. Um, And as we we see evil uh, wanting to rear its ugly head and to gain ground. And Lord, we know, we know um, that our, our country and our world is being run by the prince of the power of the air, but there's spiritual darkness. But God, I pray that you would help us as your children uh, to be the light of the world, to, to exert influence, to seek to win souls, and dear Lord, to use influence where we're allowed to and capable of legally within our country. I thank you, God, for our freedoms that you've given to us, and I pray, God, that you would continue to give us a space of freedom to operate. Lord, please be with uh, our missionaries tonight. We've read about Joel Desir and about the Braxton, the Jacksons. I pray, God, that you'd protect them. And Lord, I thank you for the good news that was shared this evening about Noreen and uh, just the good uh, report back. Um, Lord, I know that there's other requests represented in this room, um, possibly even some unspokens. Help us, Lord, to be faithful as we take these before the throne of grace and not to forget uh, the power that prayer is. Be with us tonight as we study your word. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Take your Bible, please, and turn with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6 tonight. I was considering what to preach on, and I thought about Galatians 6, and, and then uh, something I've been dealing with, and just the, the conversation topic has come up frequently, um, is represented in Ephesians chapter 6. And of course, if you know that passage, we're talking about spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare, it's interesting because there's some things that, um, obviously you guys know that the lost world does not understand spiritual things. You say, what do you mean, pastor? Well, the Bible tells us in, in Corinthians chapter 2, the natural man, what does that mean? It means somebody who's not saved, somebody who is still living in their human nature. It's in the carnal nature, the fallen nature. The natural man, somebody who hasn't been regenerated in Christ, Uh, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. You guys remember what Jesus told uh, Nicodemus? Nicodemus said, hey, you know, he's trying to butter up Jesus, and they're, they're on the rooftop, and he said, we know you're from God. Nobody can do these things except they be from God. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, I say unto you, unless a man be born again, he shall not see, shall not see, the kingdom of God. And I take that to mean this, that as the wind blows here and blows there and the average person might ignore it, and as the spirit moves here and moves there and the average person might notice it, that in order for you to understand and have discernment in the things of the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And so when it comes to this subject of spiritual warfare, the world just kind of mops this right along in with uh, science fiction, you know, Um, and dragon slayers and demon hunters and the whole mix. But we know that it's something different, and I hope you know that it's something different. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, or Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read this passage, and then we'll get into the text tonight. So he gets to the end of his book here, and he says, beginning in verse 10, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he used the word finally. I'll try not to do that until I'm at the end of the sermon. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to promise too much. In conclusion, I say it halfway through. No, I'm not going to do that. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Understand this, your battle in this world against evil is not against people. Now, you might feel like it is, because the forces of darkness use people. But people are casualties of war. Jesus Christ died for people. Do you guys believe that? God is not willing that any should perish. Who's he talking about? People. But that all should come to repentance. So can people do evil things? Yes. Are people your spiritual enemy? No. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Society and Hollywood, Hollywood does because it's sensational, misportray this subject of spiritual warfare. I want to spend a few minutes tonight talking about spiritual warfare. And I believe God wants you to understand spiritual warfare. We won't totally um, exposit this subject tonight. I just want to talk about a few things. We'll walk through the passage and make some observations and hopefully open your eyes to how it works in your life. So I pray that God would give me, Lord, please give me um, efficiency. I believe God wants us to understand spiritual warfare, to prepare for spiritual warfare, and to properly engage in it. Because you, whether you realize it or not, you are in the battle on a daily basis. If you have ever been tempted to do wrong when you know to do right, that is the battle. Do you guys understand me? Uh, spiritual warfare is not some Catholic monk, forgive me, with a relic and holy water going out and performing exorcisms. That is not spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is the child of God doing right and growing spiritually on a daily basis in spite of the attacks of the adversary and the world around us. That is spiritual warfare. And see, your strength in spiritual warfare, where does it come from? Verse 10, be strong in the Lord. It requires strength to win a battle. It requires, many times, it requires endurance to win a battle. And it's going to take strength to live the Christian life. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. I find it very significant that the Word of God says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now that, that last phrase there, that, 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 uh, <laughs> The prepositional phrase, which strengtheneth me, sometimes we leave that off and we just say, I can do all things through Christ, and we take it way out of context. Christ strengthens you to engage in spiritual warfare. Christ strengthens you to live a sanctified life. You can live a sanctified life in Christ's strength. That's what He strengthens you to do. And it's not your physical strength. It's a spiritual war. And it's not your strength of character. Some people say, well, I just have a strong character. All right, well, you might be a character. (laughs) A lot of us are. It's not your willpower, all right? And I don't believe we're called or capable of withstanding or conquering, of having true victory that we face unless it's in God's strength because of who we're fighting. We're fighting the devil and how he attacks us. He doesn't attack us with things that we can easily withstand. He attacks us in our weaknesses. By the way, if you're saved, you've been forgiven by the power of God, born again by the power of God, and you're called to live the life that God calls you to by the power of God. Galatians 5.16 says, it says, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Jesus said in John 15, He says, without me ye can do nothing. So your strength in spiritual warfare is the Lord's, and your enemy, this is incredibly important, one of the One of the most effective methods of winning a war is to get people confused as to who their enemy really is. Disguising. Our enemy is not people. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You know, on a daily basis, you might walk out into society and you see people that are engaging in open sin. You see people that for all intents and purposes are mocking God. You see people that don't want to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you try to talk to them, they're rude, they might be offended. Can I tell you that those people are lost? Those people need Jesus Christ. 
But for the grace of God, that would be you. Those people are not your enemy. But pastor, they sure act like my enemy. It's because they're being controlled by the enemy. And if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. See, it says right here, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You need to remember that because sometimes you'll be tempted to become bitter against people who look like your enemy and they're not. They just need to get saved. And by the way, that's why you're still here, so that you can witness to them so they can get saved. By the way, uh, witnessing to those people that look like the enemy is part of your spiritual armor. It says in verse 15, having your feet shod with the preparation of the, what's that word there? Gospel of peace. Every time you share the gospel with a flesh and blood person who is being controlled or influenced by the enemy, that is spiritual warfare. How do I engage in spiritual warfare, Pastor? Sharing the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Isn't that what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and all Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You want to engage in spiritual warfare? Share the gospel. That's one way. So our enemy is not flesh and blood, but it's against principalities It's the devil. Verse 11 says, we stand against the wiles of the devil. That word devil is translated from the word diabolos, Satan, false accuser, slanderer. He he cannot have your soul, so he seeks to have you serve sin by trickery and temptation and lies. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5 that he goes about as a roaring lion seeking, seeking whom he may devour. He doesn't devour Christians physically, but he can devour your testimony if you fall to sin. That's spiritual warfare. You're under attack. Demonic forces, yes, principalities and powers. There's an organizational structure, an apparent organized force of evil. And there is an average you know, human army, army, so why not in spiritual armies? And the sphere of their operations is in this world. Verse 12, the rulers of the darkness of this world. How many understand there's darkness in the world today at work? You see it, and you hear it, and it's tangible, and you can see it at work. In high places, by the way, the word there, high places, is heavenly places. Our, Our adversary, the devil, is in heavenly places accusing the brethren, and his attacks are less than direct sometimes. The world is not our enemy, but as casualties of war, the world seeks to draw us in. Uh, You're there in Ephesians 6. Look back at Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 1. It says, You hath he quickened, being made alive, who were dead. It doesn't mean you were physically dead. It means you were spiritually dead. And you, you produced more death because the wages of sin is death in your life. As you continued to sin, you reaped more death. And so you, you dying, you would one day die. But God quickened you and He saved you because this was your life. In time past, ye walked according to the course of this world like a clock that is wound up and set and on its course. And so sinners will sin until they die. And that's the way we were. The course of this world is, who's running it, pastor? Well, they're following their lusts. And and you know who plays on the lusts? The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past. That used to be the manner of life in which we lived. Our citizenship was there. Our identity was there. And our future was there until what time God saved us. So when we look at the world, recognize that that's where you were. That's what you've been saved from. But he's working in the world through lust. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. How many understand that pride is a powerful tool? It's being used daily. It's being used to to pull in our young people. They see sports figures, and they see celebrities, and they seem to be living the life. And the young person thinks, oh, that's the life. If I get that, I'll have image, I'll have fame, I'll be well known. Friend, that is the pride of life, and it's an attack. That's the enemy. 
And the greatest match is no mat, the greatest man is no match for Satan's snares and temptations. And on his best day, the adversary is no match for the Lord. So if I'm no match for him and he's no match for God, whose strength do I need? God's strength. That's why it says in Ephesians 6, verse 13, it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, God's armor, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. Not just barely make it, but to withstand, and having done all, to stand, to take a stand successfully. James chapter 4 says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. 1 John 4.4 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So your enemy is the devil and the forces of darkness and the world is used in the attack and your flesh answers back to the temptation. You've got to tell it no. And our strength comes from the Lord. Notice our objective. Look at verse 11. We probably won't get much further than this, but that's okay. Verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to, what's that word? Stand Stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 13 says that ye may be able to withstand, so the attack is coming, and having done all to stand. It's significant in the book of Ephesians, the Bible tells us five times in the book of Ephesians to walk. And, and in Scripture, the, the word walk, walk is used as a metaphor for our life. It's each step represents decisions. And when you get saved, you're called to walk differently. You guys understand that, right? Our decisions are called to be different uh, than, than what they were before. Uh, Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. As I take steps guided by God's word, I allow God to determine the steps in my life. I'm supposed to live differently and walk differently, but understand this, that change of direction, that that new life that you're called to live. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So you're a new creature now, and God says, since you're a new creature, old things need to fall away. Some of those old behaviors need to fall out of your life, and you need to begin putting in some new behaviors and being like Jesus Christ. You guys do understand that that new walk or new way of life is not going to be without resistance. It's going to be hard. It's going to take a, it's going to, you're going to have to take a stand. Every warfare has an enemy. And every warfare has a battlefield and a battle plan. And spiritual warfare, the battle plan or battlefield is your heart. And the battle plan is over who will control your heart and your spirit. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know what the devil wants in your life, if I could say, among other things, is to control your heart and your mind. Because as he controls your heart and your mind, you know what he can do? He can control your actions. Spiritual warfare, then, is not wielding some relic, supernatural weapon, trying to vanquish Satan. It's not casting out demons. Spiritual warfare is resisting temptation. Spiritual warfare is obeying the Word of God when it's difficult. Spiritual warfare is doing right and walking like Christ. Just consider the commandments in this book. Do you realize you are the chosen, righteous children of God tonight? If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, God chose you to be righteous. He's declared you righteous. you know that that's under attack? Do you think the devil wants you to forget that? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know that if you are a child of God tonight, you're alive from the dead, saved by grace through faith, and called to walk in good works to Jesus Christ? Your purpose of life has changed. How many think that the devil doesn't want you to focus on that this evening? That's under attack. That's spiritual warfare. And so when you begin to lose track of those things, you're under attack. Sometimes we submit ourselves to attack because of the influences we bring in, our media, the things we listen to, the things we read, we bring the attack into our own home. Yeah. You know, the Bible calls us to unity in the body of Christ. Ephesians 4 says, you're called to lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. If you've ever been tempted not to do those things, that's spiritual warfare. Yeah. 
And if you've ever resisted that temptation, and you've, you've been meek, you've had lowliness, you've had long-suffering, you have forgiven when you didn't feel like it, you have obtained victory in that battle. That's what that means. Uh, turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Look at this. Look at verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying. Are Christians ever tempted to lie? Well, April 15th is coming up. (laughs) If you've ever been tempted to lie, that's spiritual warfare. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. If you've ever been tempted to stay angry with another believer, to let it smolder, that's spiritual warfare. By the way, when you allow that anger to smolder and you let the sun go down upon your wrath, look what it says in verse 27. It says, neither give place to the devil. You give space to the devil to work in your life. So in a warfare, you don't want to give over ground to Satan. But friend, when we disobey the word of God, we're giving the devil a space to operate and making him comfortable. We may not have lost that battle yet, but we will. Neither let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his own hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to that which needeth. Instead of stealing from somebody, why don't you go get a job and work hard, and that way you can help other people. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That means words that have a corrupting influence on other people. If you've ever been tempted to say something that doesn't need to be said, that is, it's not edifying, and you just say, well, I just have to speak my mind. Well, maybe not. That's spiritual warfare. It says, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it might minister grace to the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, clamor is noise, like drama, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. If you've ever been tempted to entertain those emotions, by the way, an emotive response, let me clear something up for you. If something happens and you have an emotion that rises up, that's an emotive response. That's not necessarily sin. It's what you do with it that's sin. Pastor, I just got so angry in the heat of the moment. God understands your flesh. All right, what do you do with that anger? Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. I just had that feeling of bitterness come up. Okay, what are you doing with it? Because right now, you're in spiritual warfare and you're under attack. And if you feed it, if you nurse it, if you make allowances for it, if you, if you share it with somebody else and try to get, you know, oh, I, I got to get somebody on my side, makes me feel a little bit better. About any of these things, you know what you're doing? You're giving space to the devil. This is spiritual warfare. We're caught in it on a daily basis. With all malice, malice is it's not causing damage to somebody, but it's wishing that something bad would happen. Instead, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Look down in chapter 5. It says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and given us Himself an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness... How many understand that covetousness is a spiritual attack? Yeah, you get get these marketing catalogs in the mail every single day, and they're they're stuffing my mailbox with junk mail trying to get me to be covetous. I'm under a covetousness attack. I walk into Harbor Freight, and I'm attacked with covetousness. Amen. But seriously, you know what it does? It causes us, and we, we joke and we laugh a little bit, but you understand that it could very quickly cause us to be discontented with what we have. And the Bible tells us, having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. For we brought nothing into this world, and we can't carry anything out. And how many Christians get wrapped up with covetousness, and so they begin worshiping things, and they have lost the battle, and for all intents and purposes, we're worthless to the kingdom of God. Covetousness isn't the only thing. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting. How many Christians 
Don't witness, and if they did, nobody would listen because they've heard that person telling dirty jokes and, and swearing, and they have a bad testimony. You think that's ever happened? They've lost that spiritual battle. Now, that doesn't mean you can't gain a good testimony, but it certainly is hard to gain back. So we come back and we say, spiritual warfare is harder than I thought. You know what? Spiritual warfare would be a lot easier if I could just get some holy water and walk around throwing it on people and casting out demons. That would be a whole lot easier than trying to resist temptation. That would be a whole lot easier than trying to be like Jesus Christ, wouldn't it? In fact, winning spiritual warfare, that's why you need God's strength. Be strong in the Lord and the power of your might. God hasn't left us without help, though. I'll read through these and close. He says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. The devil's a liar. We're encountered, we're encounter uh, attacks on truth daily. So know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8:32. Loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Live a life that is worthy of the gospel. Do what is right, regardless of what society does. Oh, well, you know, the times have changed. That's okay. The Bible hasn't. And have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You leave tracks where you go. I was thinking about shoes, but it also made me think about gospel tracks. If your feet left tracks on the floor, you know... It should have to do with the gospel. Wherever we go, we should be having gospel conversations. And above all, taking the shield of faith, having the idea that this is that which protects everything else, the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I was speaking with somebody just today, and he said, I was woke up at two in the morning with thoughts of anxiety. I said, well, did you want to feel anxious? He said, no. Had you done anything to make yourself feel anxious? He said, no. I said, friend, you were under spiritual attack. And in that instant, if you know that it's spiritual attack from the devil, then friend, that determines how we react to it. I believe, I believe we should rebuke it. Now, I'm an independent Baptist. You guys know that. But I think sometimes independent Baptists could learn a couple things and we we can break free from some stuff. And, And listen, when it comes to this kind of thing, In that moment of spiritual attack, this is exactly what your pastor does. You might think I'm crazy after we leave tonight. That's all right. This is what I do. I rebuke it. I don't want to allow any any place for it. If there's a force of darkness that's causing this, and so I just very simply say, I don't want to feel this. I don't want to think this. If there is someone causing this, you are not welcome in my house. And then I call out to God. I don't get all boogeyman with trying to figure out names of demons and stuff. That's foolishness. But I'll tell you this, God can help you. So you cry out to God. And then I'll quote scripture. And you, you do that three-pronged attack a couple times and those battles, they'll start to lessen up. I'm telling you. Above all, taking the shield of faith and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Just like I said, the Word of God. Praying always with prayer and supplication. There it is. Call out to God. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul says in the midst of this, I need boldness as well. Christian, you are in a spiritual battle. You leave here tonight, you might not encounter a a battle on the way home. But you're going to tomorrow. You'll be challenged with anger, lust, jealousy, covetousness, apathy. Yeah, apathy's not good either, okay? If you're serving God, you'll face opposition and persecution. You are swimming upstream. The adversary doesn't want you to win. So take up the armor of God. Understand you need God's strength and call out to the Lord for help. You might be sitting here tonight and you've never taken a stand for the Lord. So the next time you're being tempted, I want to encourage you to do something. Next time you're tempted, stop and ask yourself and identify, where is this coming from? And more than just trying to summon up the willpower to say no, call out to God to help. And open your Bible, the sword of the Spirit. It's the Word of God. And if you need to, get on the phone and call up a believer to pray with you.
That's how you win battles, right? Two are stronger than one. And with God's help, we can win. Be strong in the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer as we close tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would help us on a daily basis to be conscious of the battle that's being waged for who's going to control my heart, each heart here. And Lord, if there's not one here who's not saved, I pray that they'd trust you as Savior. Chances are on a night like tonight, most of us are, but Lord, I pray that you'd help us to take this seriously, to recognize that if we ignore it, we're just giving more place for the devil to operate. Lord, I'm tired of him winning battles. We know he's not going to win the war. Help us, dear Lord, to live in victory. In your name I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet, heads bowed and eye closed? If God has spoken to your heart, do business with the Lord as the piano plays. And amen. Are you glad you're saved tonight? If you're saved, God's won the war. You're more than conquerors. So let's leave and let's live like it. Amen. Brother John, would you close us in a word of prayer tonight, after which you'll be dismissed?